Economic historians have looked as best one can at standards of living in Athens in 500s BC at the time of Pericles and looked at standards of living in London around 1800. Some of them think that there was essentially no growth in standards of living. Some of them think that standards of living grew by as much as 50 or 75 percent. No one thinks that over that 2,300 year period, standards of living as much as doubled. For most of that time, human beings lived at the edge of subsistence. When there was more to eat, more people were born, and population rose. When there was less to eat, um, populations uh, fell. Toil was backbreaking. And then, in many ways, the greatest thing that ever happened in human history, the combination of markets and technological progress drove the Industrial Revolution. At first, it wasn't so fast. Standards of living grew less than 1% a year in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. Even at the time of our country's most rapid economic growth around the turn of the 20th uh, century, it took a generation for standards of living to double. What's happening today in large parts of the world is growth is taking place at a rate where you can see standards of living uh, double in a decade or even a little faster, pointing to the possibility that they could double many times over, half a dozen times, uh, seven times over in a human lifetime, <laughs> representing more progress, more human emancipation uh, than has ever taken place uh, before. So markets, the application, reason, the application of technology are staggeringly potent forces. And yet, even as that is happening, I think it is probably fair to say that there is as much skepticism about capitalism, about the modern corporation, about our great public institutions, as at any time in this country since the Second World War. Part of it is a reflection of failures of elites. The Vietnam War was one kind of failure of elites. Watergate was another kind of failure of elites. What's happened in too many public, urban public schools was another kind of failure of uh, elites. The financial crisis was another kind of failure of um, elites. Part of it, and that financial crisis is surely particularly important right now. Part of it, though, is a sense that avarice, unanchored, can be very, very costly, as we saw during uh, the financial crisis. If you look at surveys, the Edelman Trust Barometer, which I guess is here today, uh, makes this point in a powerful way. Respect for corporations is at a low ebb, and respect for government is in a low ebb as well. So the question that is important, in many ways more important than the budget deficit, is the trust deficit and what we're going to do about that uh, trust uh, deficit. And I don't think anybody has the answer, and I suspect uh, when history is written some time from now, there will not have been any single or couple of uh, answers. But it seems to me that one important aspect of the question is this. 
We have had for many years deeply embedded in our thinking a model of the corporation which might be called the avarice with a policeman model. That model has as its basic idea that there are shareholders, that if the shareholders like the corporation, they can hold it. If the shareholders don't like the corporation, they can sell it. But since you can look up its value on your BlackBerry every nanosecond, basically what the corporation should do is make the share price be as high as it possibly can and do whatever will achieve that objective subject to complying with the law. That since there are things you could do that would be good for the shareholders and bad for the world, dumping untreated waste uh, in uh, rivers, using children um, as uh, your labor force, misleading potential customers of your product, that government's got a role to be a policeman. And government needs to make the best rules it can. And then corporations need to maximize their share price as long as they comply with the rules. I think you got a kind of constant cat and mouse game where the government tries to make as many rules as it can to make sure nobody does anything wrong. And the, corpora and the corporations um, try to comply with the rules to the minimum extent necessary while making as much as they can. And everybody else watches the spectacle of the battle. And if you actually read a textbook on economic regulation, that's what it will talk about. If you read a textbook on the modern corporation, uh, that's uh, what uh, it will talk about. And in many ways, that system has produced staggering benefits. And every time somebody said, let's scrap that system and have a different system, which is have the government run all the corporations and then the government will run them benignly, it's ended in calamity. By the way, when there haven't been private owners and the government's own things, as in Russia or China, the environmental consequences, the exploitation of labor have been much, much worse. But it isn't a elevating, an entirely elevating spectacle. And so it's natural to ask whether there's another aspect. And one place where one can get a hint as to what that other aspect is, is to look at the way in which our professions have traditionally functioned. And Weber wrote all about this. If you look at doctors, they've got many of the same basic incentives that auto mechanics have. They understand it, you don't. They do things, you pay them. Um, <laughs> you're scared, you've never seen it before. They've seen it many times. And the way in which our society manages that is we've created medicine as a profession and yes, we have malpractice, yes, we have rules of licensure, but the most important control we have is we have ethical norms governing participation in uh, that profession. And those ethical norms constrain exploitation. They substitute for what would otherwise be punitive um, regulation. They don't always work but they contribute in a very important way to uh, trust. And when they break down, and you've seen some of this in medicine, you've seen some of this in law, you've seen some of this in uh, for-profit higher education, you see some adverse consequences. And those ethical aspects aren't a whole solution, but they provide a very important dimension. The way in which I think about this is that we need more of that with respect to basic corporate behavior. 
The shareholders are owners. Ownership is a hugely important uh, thing. As I've said before, no one ever washed a rented car. Actually, I've said that a few times, and I, then I always get a, then I always get mail. You know, some guy writes a letter and says, "Well, actually, my aunt is crazy, and she did wash her rented car." <laughs> or, or I've gotten a few, I've gotten a few versions of. Actually, I did wash a rented car because I smashed the car up and I wanted to make it so the rental car company wouldn't notice. <laughs> and I thought the least I could do was wash it. Um, so I had a better chance of faking it. But, you know, how well, do you take care, how well do you take care of your house? How well do you take care of your hotel room? There's a difference. So ownership is a hugely important thing. And what we want, and owners are governed by a sense of right and wrong, by a sense of wanting to do the right thing beyond trying simply to maximize the value of their asset. And those are the norms that we, I believe, are going to need to increasingly incorporate into corporate life. It's not easy. The share price has the very great virtue of being very definite and very clearly measurable every hour. When you move beyond it, inevitably you undermine accountability and responsibility. If I don't, um, if, if my company's not doing very well, well, I can say, well, yeah, we're not actually earning that much money, but you know, we're really working to create a better world, and you know, it takes a long time to produce a greater world, and you know, how are you gonna tell whether we are or whether we're not? So how we find the accountability, competition, and force for efficiency that has made business such a potent engine of progress, while at the same time instilling the element of ethical ownership, is I think one of the great questions of our time. And it's never a question that's going to be answered perfectly. But it is a question, the answer to which will enable us to move beyond the debilitating struggle of cat and mouse between the forced avaricious company and the government trying to function as policemen. And that's why, whether you call it connected capitalism, collaborative governance, shared value uh, capitalism, or a ham and Swiss cheese sandwich, it seems to me that these kinds of efforts are so profoundly important. And just as the world gropes its way with a lot of different people trying in a lot of different ways to establish cell phone communication in the best possible way through competition and some ideas flourish and other ideas uh, fail and ideas that look particularly promising at one stage recede and ideas that look like they're not going to make it ultimately prove to be the most important ideas. So that kind of thing is going to happen in this sphere. That's what happens in a dynamic and uh, competitive uh, society and none of us can know where it's going to go. But it seems to me that the thinking is something that is uh, profoundly important, that the gains from getting this right are about as large as the gains from anything else, and the risks of delegitimizing the greatest engines for human progress that there have ever been are also very real. And that makes this kind of conversation a very, very important one. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Larry, thanks very much. I think that's uh, a magnificent scene set for the sort of discussion we want to have over the, uh, over the next half an hour. <clears throat> I just want to, because uh, I'm going to be the, uh, the, the policeman uh, to <laughs> some degree. Um, but what I want to do, I've got to get my Kindle back up again. Um, I want to go back to 
the article that which I know you've all read, you've all read my speech of two years ago. Um, <laughs> but when I did say... Every night before I go yeah. to sleep. <laughs> Well, I, I, I know it'll put you to sleep quickly, that's for sure. Um, I fed you that. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I did uh, sound a real note of concern uh, about what this meant from a political dimension in terms of the support for capitalism, support uh, for what, for society, of society as, as a whole for capitalism and for the system that we have. Um, to go back to a periodical which is not represented here, but The Economist this last, in the last edition um, expires today, uh, actually reported on a poll. And they alerted uh, in their article that this poll is a very serious form of damage of the falling support for capitalism. Uh, it's most marked, the falling support, in the country that used to epitomize free enterprise. In 2002, 80% of Americans agreed that the world's best bet was the free market system. By 2010, that had fallen to 59%, only a little above the 54% average for the 25 countries polled. Now, interestingly enough, and they used to use the word nominally, nominally communist China is now one of the world's strongest supporters of capitalism at 68% up from 66, but Brazil is at 68, Germany's at 69, and guess what? In terms of uh, strongly supporting the free market system, uh, France is actually at 6%, um, right at the bottom end. But, but as, as you go through some of the other, uh, uh, other, Turkey, it's as low as 27. There are outliers, Spain, I gave you Germany, um, but you know, all, all around the world, you're looking at the support dropping. And that's just what's happened over the last two years. The stark one is in the US, Americans earning below $20,000 a year. Their support has, over the last uh, one year, dropped from 76% to 44%. Now, that's a that is political dynamite. That's there for people to grab, um, for people to make a hay out of, and to maybe change uh, the way that we look at the relationship of government with business and, and with society with business. And the proposition we have, because what you have here on the podium is business. I'm, I'm not going to do the representation. Uh, you've got civil society, and you've got someone who can represent ac academia, and, and government, the, the three pillars of the triangle of sustainability. Helene, what do you, what do you think's going wrong? I mean, you, you've been very involved in very productive relationships with a, with a number of organizations. You see the benefit of that, you see the positive reporting of that, that that's, uh, that's going on, and yet uh, it, it's not making any impact against this, this tide of saying, um, our free market system is broken, our cap capitalism is broken, we're, we're looking for some, for some other way. How do, how do you react to that? Well, you know, I think, um, first of all, um, in the areas that we work in, uh, most, of, most of our clients are in poor countries. We're um, an care is an organization working in 70 countries around the world and really looking at the emerging markets. And I think if you, if you were to ask people in the emerging markets versus um, your average American citizen, you might get a very different uh, response. I also think, um, you know, in the, the, that more and more this notion of, of um, as you call it, a socially responsible uh, corporation, I think it is going to change the way people think. Um, we know in talking to the, the corporations that we work in, their staff are more likely to feel good about going to work when they know that their company is actually involved in something that's making a good, making a difference in people's lives. And so, you know, I think it, it will take time, but I do think that this whole area of a very different kind of relationship between um, corporations like Coca-Cola and, and uh, 
the big partnership that CARE has when we're looking at how do you bring uh, clean and safe drinking water to people around the world or our, um, our uh, longstanding um, partnership with UPS here who has helped us substantially, not just in giving uh, some money and go, saying go build a schoolhouse, but in helping us with our supply chain logistics. It made a huge impact in the Haiti um, earthquake, the fact that we had a, a partner who not only gave resources, but also helped us improve our supply chain. We were able to get uh, supplies into Haiti that many people couldn't uh, within days as opposed to weeks. So I think it's those, those kinds of examples where uh, companies are now building these strategic relationships, long-term relationships, that I think it will help um, their staff feel better about what they do. I think it is going to bring um, a different sense of, of you know, what is a corporation. I think, you know, as, as Larry has said, though, um, clearly a corporation is in the business of making money. But I think more and more we're realizing that those two things are not, um, you know, they're, they're not at odds with each other. Um, you can do good and you can do well, and I think we're proving that every day. Larry, you, you I mean, you are very, very clear about the fact that we have to look at the, uh, the, the first job of a company, which is to earn a legitimate profit and to make a return to the shareholders, and that this is not about creating corporations in a way that they become in any way philanthropies. The, 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 they add much, much more in terms of just doing what they do every day uh, it, uh, it to the best interest of the shareholders. But where we are uh, here is that we're seeing, and I'm going to cover the second question on this later on, but we're seeing within society demands for more ethical con conduct of corporations, more engagement of corporations uh, uh, as a whole. It, in a way, it's quite easy when you'd say, well, you know, what we really want, the next level is a, you know, socially responsible corporation because, uh, by the way, that adds e incremental value over the long term to the company. It improves the sustainability of the company. And I, I think that's reasonably saleable. But how do you marry the short term, the BlackBerry, with the Warren Buffett view of the world in terms of investing for the long term? And uh, you know, if you if you put in more of the policemen in there, that's that's not going to solve it either. But how how do we change people's, I guess, basic DNA about boy, if I can make a penny today rather than a penny tomorrow, that's what I want to do. Uh, and, and therefore uh, really provide momentum to looking at the long term, which then allows people to look at companies that are sustainable in the long term in uh, a, a different way. I guess I'd give you a couple of, an a couple of answers uh, to that, uh, Neville. One is it didn't work out so great for the guys who invested in Enron. Didn't even invest, didn't work out so great for the guys who invested in Enron at the beginning of 2000, who were only planning to hold the stock for a couple of months. It really didn't. And so increasingly, and you see it in the uh, investment community, uh, there was a time when all people cared about was the quantity of earnings. Every year you start to see more emphasis on the quality of earnings. What's that really about? What that's really about is, did you get your earnings by developing a skill and capacity that you're going to be able to replicate year after year? Or did you get your earnings by hiring some people and promising to pay them 10 years from now a pension that you managed not to accrue as a liability? Did you get your earnings by deferring uh, maintenance, or did you get your earnings by building a customer uh, base? And so to some extent, um, even if you're not trying to get, um, even if people aren't holding the company for the long run, as long as they recognize that they need another buyer, and that that next buyer is going to think ahead. 
if you have the right kind of uh, metrics and the right kind of emphasis, you can strengthen incentives uh, to take uh, the long run uh, view. But I am very much a believer in the old uh, management consultant adage uh, that what you count counts and that metrics do matter and that we are going to have to find metrics and the emphasis on the quality of earnings is uh, one such development in this direction that do a better job of reflecting how well a corporation is doing in taking uh, the long view just so as to encourage uh, people uh, to take uh, the long view. Uh, you know, to venture into an area that you know literally infinitely more about uh, than uh, I do, uh, my impression is that if you add up all the plant and all the equipment and all the contracts possessed by the Coca-Cola company, um, it may come to as much as 40% of the market value of uh, the Coca-Cola company. The largest part of the market value of the Coca-Cola company derives in uh, the reputation and the set of associations um, involved with the Coca-Cola brand. Well, if you look in a more general way at uh, markets, what you will see is that uh, the ratio of market value of companies to the value of their physical plant and equipment is something that has tended to rise uh, over time. And that's a reflection of the fact that these intangible assets are becoming more and more important as a source of value. And therefore, they become that much more important for corporate managers uh, to uh, nurture and uh, develop. So I think the answer has to lie in more, um, more and better metrics. Because one oddity of this idea of stakeholders and this idea that corporations need to maximize the benefit of stakeholders is that it's uh, been my observation that it's kind of like a barbell. Um, the, on the one side, some of the most enlightened companies, like uh, Coca-Cola in your era, uh, talk a great deal about it and don't just talk uh, about it. They act on it and drive it through their compensation systems, through their human resource systems, and the like. On the other hand, frankly, some of the worst companies that actually are not performing for shareholders, instead of saying, well, we failed, they say we have to understand. You can't really look at the shareholders because we were really working for the stakeholders. And it's really complicated to work for the stakeholders, so it's really hard to know whether we're succeeding or whether we're not. And we don't really have any of that great metrics, but we were working for the stakeholders. And if you come after our management, you are attacking the idea of stakeholders. So, you know, just as it's been, just as patriotism is a deep value, but also the last refuge of scoundrels. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, you've heard both of those things said. Um, there is that aspect around this emphasis on stakeholders. And I think the answer to it uh, lies in the development of uh, better conceptualized, better measured, and better implemented metrics. Helene, is this just a Western world thing? I mean, you work, you work primarily in the developing world. Um, are, 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 are we working with, in a way within our own uh, economic and geographic silo with regard to this? Or is this something that you see has got relevance from a, from a global standpoint? Yeah, no, definitely. I think it has relevance from a global standpoint. And you know, more and more of our partnerships are with um, um, large co corporations who see that it is going to be in their best interest to engage in the emerging markets. And so it's definitely not something that um, we see as 
just within our borders. And I think as more and more um, corporations recognize that, that their new markets are going to be the places that we're currently working in and that uh, you know, you've heard the term base of the pyramid, that, that, those, that those people at the base of the pyramid actually have an economic uh, value and potential. And so, you know, more and more companies that we're working with are really helping us, uh, whether it's in the textile industry to help poor women learn how to make better um, uh, fabric so that they can be sold and brought to market and have a real value or uh, as we're doing with uh, Walmart um, working with cashew farmers they have helped give management training to the cashew farmers help to improve the the actual um, productivity and they're now buying back those cashews so it's a win-win situation people have, have learned a skill um, they are uh, they are um, getting, earning an income. They're able to send their children to school. They're able to change their lives. And at the same time, Walmart is getting a, a, a great product. So I think more and more as we recognize that the next markets are, in fact, the very places that organizations like us and others work in, that um, you know, I think more and more companies are going to see that it's to their advantage. But then on, on the other hand, you've, you've got people who are going to push back, Larry, and they're going to say, well, you know, th this broader definition of, of you know, value, not just being the, uh, what flows the bottom line, but values, what does the company stand for? Uh, you know, we're up in a global economy. We're up against now new emerging multinationals that come out of China, that come out of India, that come out of... Uh, parts of the developing world, and you know their their standards and therefore their cost base is very different to to ours, and that is is something where well I, I, w we have to be sure that they're going to meet those same standards. There then comes a call for regulation on a global basis, which can run against one of the other great enablers of. Uh, spread of economic wealth, free trade. How, how do you square that in terms of the, uh, the, the, the policeman and the value-based company? There's about two questions there. Uneasily. <laughs> you know, there was a, a guy from uh, GE at our dinner last night who uh, put this uh, very well, I thought, in terms of uh, the challenge from uh, hybrid uh, capitalism. You know, frankly, in the United States, uh, we think of it, not always, and there's some exceptions to this, but you know, we, we sort of do think about it as government is uh, the regulator that sort of sets the rules and assures fair competition and protects the stakeholders and all of that. There are other parts of uh, the world where government is the cheerleader and organizer for the major corporations. You know, in the United States, and to take an area I've had some experience with, there's a clamor to find a way to, quote, do something about too big to fail because it creates distortions in the financial system of various kinds. Well, there are other countries in this world where the basic objective of financial regulatory policy is to assure everybody that the major local banks are too big to fail so that they will be able to attract deposits, grow, and do more business at the expense of American uh, institutions, uh, of American and uh, British uh, in, uh, institutions. So I think as we think about these things, we need to not be um, naive um, about what's going on uh, in other countries. That's why we in the Obama administration have made a big effort to step up various kinds of trade uh, enforcement. That's why we've tried to bring issues that uh, 
frankly, were always treated as outside of international dialogue, like countries using their exchange rates to pursue mer mercantile objectives into uh, the uh, international uh, dialogue. That's why we've recognized uh, that uh, sometimes that maybe it would be better if companies all just competed on their own, but that uh, if uh, the uh, president of Germany is going to stand up for Siemens when Siemens is trying to export and the leaders of Europe are going to stand up for Airbus, that uh, leaders in the United States are going to have to put uh, standing up for Boeing and standing up for GE more on their agenda than uh, they have in the past. And so I think these are things uh, that uh, we are going to have to uh, recognize and uh, grapple with uh, in a um, in a strong uh, way. And I think that those who want to see corporations serve uh, stakeholders as well as shareholders need to remember that bankrupt, struggling corporations don't serve their customers very well, can't serve their workers or their uh, communities, and need to be prepared to support the kinds of approaches that enable companies to flourish and succeed in their core mission. Because if they don't flourish and succeed in some of the, in the core activity of producing stuff, goods or services, at a cost that's less than it can be sold for, if they don't succeed in doing that, they're not going to succeed in doing anything for any stakeholder. And that's a recognition that we also need uh, to have as we think about um, uh, international uh, competition. I think there's one final thing we, that I would emphasize, and I think it's a uh, it's another place where the prevailing mental model and what's true are actually different. Everyone goes and studies some kind of economics course and they learn about comparative advantage and they learn about you know somebody who exports wine and somebody else exports bread or uh, whatever. Here's a fact. More than half of international trade takes place within multinational corporations. That is to say, it's not stuff getting produced in one place and getting purchased by consumers uh, in a different place. It's a company that in some way has integrated its production process and its trade in tasks rather than trade in goods. Once you see it that way, hobbling the whole process seems like a much more difficult idea and a much more problematic idea in terms of everybody's objective. I'll tell you who'd be most enthusiastic about making it harder to integrate production between the United States and Mexico. All the people in Asia who are competing with North America who would see North American firms as in a much less, a much less strong position uh, to compete. So I think once we recognize the prevalence of trade in tasks rather than trade in goods, we have an additional reason for thinking that walling things off is probably not going to be uh, the ultimate way to success. Let me just move to, I, I talk about the tri triangle of sustainability, about the civil society, government, uh, and, and business working together. With Within that paradigm, you're sitting uh, representing uh, civil society, represent, let's, let's just take it representing care. Which one of the other two do you find it easier to collaborate and work with, putting you really on the spot here? Which of the two, and, and when you give the answer, why? Um, it depends. 
I thought that's what you might say. Yeah. I, 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 honestly, I mean, it, it really does depend. You know, clearly, um, for us working with the corporate sector and doing it well takes time, and it takes uh, building a partnership. And as we all know, true partnerships don't come easy. Um, sometimes it may take a year to really, you know, if we're if we're not just talking about some uh, small token of corp corporate social responsibility, but really looking at a, you know, kind of a a multi-level partnership where it may be resources, it may be expertise, but it's something that's really in both parties' interests. That takes time, and it takes develop it, figuring out where is that real area of mutual um, benefit. Um, and we talk different languages. Um, we, you know, we have a different customer base, if you will. So I think it, it, it really is an area where it takes some time. The government, on the other hand, um, you know, has its own set of, uh, of challenges. Uh, when I think about our, our work with the U.S. government, which is a, a major uh, funder of CARES work, um, huge amount of requirements are imposed on an organization like ours. Um, and, you know, again, it takes, it takes time, it takes building systems, it takes really developing uh, a mentality that allows those two organizations to, to, to play well together. That said, I think, you know, as you have said many times, you need all three. And if we didn't have government structures that allowed for, uh, you know, uh, a strong regulatory environment, um, a strong business ecosystem, if we didn't have all of those things that government, uh, you know, is responsible for, we would not be able to do the work that we do with corporate, with the corporate sector. So it really does take all of those um, different partners if you're going to have a successful, truly a successful partnership. What should and could be done with regard to uh, bringing government into this process in a more meaningful way? I think you're seeing some uh, uh, some real progress. I think you're seeing it in the way in which the president has reached out to a group of uh, CEOs uh, headed by Jeff Immelt to work together on uh, competitiveness uh, questions in a spirit of uh, cooperation. I think you're seeing it in the kinds of dialogues that are taking place on math science uh, education. I think you're seeing that there are more and more problems that actually do require collaborative uh, solutions. I'll give you an example of something I worked some on uh, when I was in uh, government. Uh, it cannot be right in the 21st century, that the average 7-Eleven uses more information technology than the average doctor's office in a country where errors associated with medical records kill 75,000 people a year. It just can't be right. And the question is, how do you solve that problem? It's gradually getting solved. I mean, there are not, there are not any doctors throwing away their computers, and there are more who are digitizing their practice records uh, each year. But it's a slow process. If government simply mandates that everybody do it overnight, there'll be all kinds of perverse consequences. They won't be on a uniform, uh, sta uniform standard. There'll be doctors in small towns who will quit their practices five years earlier than they otherwise would have, rather than incur the expense, leaving people without health care. So you're really not going to get there in an adversarial way. Frankly, if government's not careful, there are a lot of people who were going to buy their medical records next year who will just be their digitization systems next year, who would be just delighted to get the happy news that instead of their having to pay for them, the government's going to have to pay for them, is going to pay for them. So the government will pay money, and it will get nothing that wouldn't have happened 
otherwise. And so what you need is a sophisticated, thoughtful uh, approach that brings together the stakeholders on the medical side, the stakeholders on the systems provision side, the people who are capable of writing the innovative systems that will actually both be totally interoperable and protect people's uh, privacy. And government can, and in this case did, have a very productive role in formulating uh, those, uh, inter uh, those interactions. And that, I think, is a model. And I think what we're going to find is that uh, there have always been many issues of this kind. If you kind of go back, the Lewis and Clark expedition was sort of a collaborative venture between the public and the private uh, sector. But that there are going to be more and more of those areas where that's going to be necessary. And we're going to have to work out uh, the approaches and uh, the paradigms uh, that uh, operate. And I guess I would say one other thing, um, uh, Neville, and I think it's probably true in both directions. There's certainly some room uh, for government to take the temperature down vis-a-vis -vis business. And there's certainly, certainly political rhetoric that happens that vilifies the pursuit of profit in ways that aren't very smart. Um, there's also some tendency in the business community to be unwilling to understand the perspective of officials in government and to think that what's good for them is necessarily uh, good for everyone. And in particular, you're eager to see me recognize that government makes mistakes in a set of ways, and I'm sure I've done it, in, done it inadequately. One of the things that, and I mentioned this last night, that I've been a little disappointed by is um, the business community tends to stand with each other. And um, when somebody does something that is unethical, that reflects adversely on the whole business community, there's a great reluctance um, to be critical of that uh, person. The business community as a group is very much, as you were in your comments, in support of open markets and global integration. But when you ask them for support on specific issues, it's amazing how frequently they decline on the grounds that they have a relationship with X who actually has an important stake uh, in a particular bit of protection. So I guess I would say communication, discussion, and mutual respect are uh, central here. That government needs to never forget that there are no employees without employers. And that in many ways, it starts with having successful, prospering businesses. And those in business need to understand that they need government and to start with a bit more of a respect that people in government are trying to do their jobs in the best way possible and have to and probably should embrace a set of considerations that are less obvious in the context of an individual company and to not assume that the uh, decisions that seem odd necessarily uh, reflect either stupidity or malevolence, <laughs> but may simply reflect uh, a different set of imperatives that come from a different role. And I, just to jump in, um, you know, I do think um, when we're talking about government, there are it, there is no monolith, and and you know when we think about the governments that, that we work with in developing countries, very very different set of issues. And so I just want to throw that out. I mean I think there's a big uh, the role that the U.S. government plays 
um, versus some of the countries that we work with, some who may or may not even have legitimate governments. Yeah, I think it's a very different uh, set of issues. And Larry, just one, want to feed you one final one to build on the, uh, you're very delicate about criticizing business in terms of how they, uh, they fail to come uh, to the party uh, in terms of key issues which they espouse in principle but not in terms of individual uh, issues. Uh, but the, the other issue is around some of the initiatives that they support broadly uh, around who pays and whether or not it is, um, uh, we're having a dialogue about the real issue in terms of solving the issue, e e e ethanol being one of those, for those examples that we, we mentioned last night, where in fact the, the real issue about trying to uh, uh, re uh, reduce CO2 emissions gets into something which then it becomes funded either by consumers or uh, by regulations or by pricing, um, uh, pushing something which actually doesn't address the main issue, in fact, is, is actually counterproductive. So this whole issue of business and subsidies uh, was something that you were quite strong about last night. So I'm feeding you that one. <laughs> you know, look, uh my, my, obs my observation is, uh, I, uh, this was probably not the most charming thing I did, but occasionally when I was in, uh, there's a lot of competition for that. Um, but, <laughs> but one of the things I was struck by and got frustrated a little bit when I was in Washington, there was all kinds of people come to come to come to your office if you have a job like mine. Various, you know, groups of six CEOs from the such and such industry would come. Uh, groups of university presidents would come. Groups of people who ran health clinics would come. Groups of people who were mayors uh, would come. And after a while, I would say to them, you know, John Kennedy gave a pretty good inaugural address, and the signature line was ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Has it ever occurred to you that instead of saying what kinds of checks you need the government to write you, that you might consider talking about what your group could do for America? And what your suggestion would be as to how you could be most constructive with respect to the country without having done uh, something for you. And I guess I'm glad you asked the question, because I should have said it before. If the business community wanted to do one thing that would change things over the next two years, it would be they would vow that in every meeting they had with a public official, one part of what they would do is come with something that they were interested in doing for America that didn't involve anybody in the government reducing a regulation on them, writing a check to them, or changing a tax provision to their benefit. And I think if that spirit were present, and by the way, I promise you that the university presidents didn't like it when I said that was really an interesting agenda they had presented, but their approach kind of reminded me of the milk producers. Um, the milk producers <laughs> always began by explaining that the dairy industry was central to America, and they explained that universities were central to America. Then the dairy producers talked about how many people were employed in the dairy industry, and they had talked about how many people were employed in universities, and on it, um, and, and on it went. But I think, uh, that spirit of it going in both directions uh, is something that I think would be hugely important. Mm -hmm. What I didn't tell you at, at the outset was uh, last year I, w I did visit uh, with Larry at the White House. And boy, am I glad I didn't ask him for any money. I didn't ask for any change. Helene, Larry, um, thank you very much uh, for spending time with us today. I think where we come out of all of this is it's hard, it's big, it's huge, 
and it's certainly not going to be very easy. But I think there's a general agreement that there's a path here which has a trajectory, which has a trajectory which has got some fundamental validity, but the solutions are not obvious. And there are many legitimate <coughs> barriers, there are many illegitimate barriers that are gonna be, have to be overcome as we walk this path to really trying to connect society together for the betterment of all of the three pieces of the triangle. And that is really key to what we're trying to do.